From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Alliance President Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch, broadcasting this week from New York City. I, I started to realize that I, I don't know too many people who change their mind because they lost an argument. <laughs> <laughs> Shane Claiborne is a prominent Christian speaker, activist, and best-selling author. Shane worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. He heads up Red Letter Christians, a movement of folks who are committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. How about that, people? At a time when religion is too often used to attack and manipulate, I want to focus on the boundless potential for good. And that's what we'll do with Shane Claiborne on this week's show. A different but widespread example of misusing something that has great potential for good is the flood of hate and bigotry poisoning the online world in which we all spend so much of our lives these days. A comprehensive new report from Interfaith Alliance titled Big Tech, Hate and Religious Freedom Online is set for release on Wednesday. And we'll get a preview from Interfaith Alliance Advocacy Associate, Rhea Coley. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and get the podcast on Apple Podcasts and all the other podcast platforms. Each week, I am in conversation with some of the most fascinating and impactful civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe to it today. State of Belief Radio is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you have made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more of the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest. Shane Claiborne is a tireless activist for peace, justice, and grace. The co-founder of Red Letter Christians, Shane's many books include Becoming the Answer to Our Prayers, The Irresistible Revolution, and Beating Guns, Hope for People Who Are Weary of Violence. Shane has a brand new book coming out February 7th, which means it is available for pre-ordering right now titled Rethinking Life, Embracing the Sacredness of Every Person. It is great to have the author back with us on State of Belief Radio. Shane, welcome. Yeah, great to be here, man. It's always good to be with you. All right. We are good. We are good. And you, I I can smell it over the radio. Uh, You just came from the forge. Do I have that right? I did. Yes, I did. We've been, uh, you know, it's only a block away from my house. And we've got this beautiful storefront right under Kensington Avenue, uh, which Kensington Avenue is, is uh, a place with a lot of troubles, you know, under the Ave. And, uh, and so we deliberately got a storefront there where we get guns off the street. We take donated guns and we decommission them. So we chop them up and we've got um, all of our equipment there to, blacksmith those guns and repurpose them so inspired by the prophets that they shall beat their swords into plows we're we're beating guns into garden tools and loving it and uh yeah what i was doing today man was i'm these handles are made from the wood stock so i've made my first handles today and i'm real excited about them so i made like four of these uh that are made from they're made from the wood wood stock from the like from the rifles you know the wood part of it so yeah it's pretty awesome so you all can't see this uh, but but i i i i'm going to explain to you what <laughs> Shane just went and grabbed something he he has a he has a trowel or something like that which is used for gardening and then also another piece of equipment that could be used for gardening and th- this is amazing so this is these are actual this is actual metal from guns that were used for violence on the streets of Philadelphia. And here they are now instruments of peace and, and, and cultivation of food sustenance for the body and the soul. That's it, man. This is a witness. This is the kind of witness. So I, I have so much to talk to you about, but I do want to take a step back and I, because I've known about you longer than I've known you, but then, but I've known you for a while. You didn't start this way. 
you came out of a quite a traditional, maybe even conservative Christian tradition. And and I, I just wonder, like, if you could just talk us through a little bit about your faith journey from where you came from it to where you are now. And I know that's a long conversation, but but give us a li- give our listeners a little bit of a sense of where you come from. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the brief version. So I, I, you know, grew up in East Tennessee and I can't hide it. Don't even want to, Paul. I, lo- I got my Southern accent and uh, grew up in the hills, small town in East Tennessee. And that's, you know, and I, I grew up hunting. My, my family were gun owners, hunters. Um, and, um, you, you know, on a lot of these issues that we feel so passionately about, Paul, and, you know, gun violence, the death penalty, militarism and war, poverty. I mean, I had strong opinions um, the other way, you know, and so that that gives me a lot of patience because I spent as much of almost as much of my life arguing for the death penalty as I've spent um, trying to end it. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I fell in love with Jesus in East Tennessee, uh, going to a Methodist church. They gave an altar call. The preacher talked about you know, what Jesus did on the cross and, and it hit me, you know, I, in the words of Wesley, I felt my heart strange, strangely warmed, you know, and I, I went mm. forward, ga- dedicated my life to Jesus. And, uh, I, you know, some people I meet their you know, their story, their testimony, <laughs> my life was such a mess. And then I met Jesus and everything came together. And for me, Paul, you know, um, it was kind of like, I, I felt like my life was pretty together and I met Jesus and that's where, things started to, you know, flip on their head because I, I saw Jesus <laughs> saying, so, you know, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, the last or first, the first or last. And, you know, here I am. I'm, I mean, just to throw it all out there, I, I was prom king, Paul, but I, I always say like, wow. it only wow. shows you what a small town I'm from. So, you know, <laughs> don't, don't be too impressed. <laughs> But I mean, I, I, you know, I kept leaning in to Jesus because I was convinced that Christianity had to be more than just um, a, a set of beliefs. You know, it was really a reorientation of our lives. And I wanted to know more about that. And that's how I ended up in Philly. I um, I went to a little school outside of Philly uh, called Eastern University, and I studied uh, sociology, interestingly enough, you know, with our friend, Tony Campolo. Yeah. And I, I always yeah. like how Tony um, and Carl Bart said this, you know, you, you've got to read the Bible in one hand, but you got to hold the newspaper in the other so that our faith doesn't just become a ticket into heaven and an excuse to ignore the world that we're living in. And so studying sociology and studying the Bible at this Christian college, you know, uh, it was it, it it really shaped who I am and, 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 and what I'm doing now is, is kind of the natural outgrowth of all that. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I think we, we, unfortunately we are at a place in this country where, you know, when someone says they're a Christian, you're like, Oh, oh like, what's that going to mean? You know, cause it, it, it has almost become identical with kind of right-wing politics. And that's a terrible thing to say because it is it is absolutely not true for the majority of Christians in America. But if you, if you like in the media or anything like that, people say, Oh, my Christian faith. And on Twitter, if someone has Christian in there, you know what they're going to do, you know? And it's very, it's very, very hard. And, and I, you know, you're, you're, you're someone who, I mean, this is completely my words, but you kind of went in there thinking, okay, this is like the cherry on the top of my perfect Sunday. This is going to be delicious. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I have to rethink the meal, you know, and, and here you are doing this work, which has been a long road for you. And I want to res- uh, just, you know, show my respect because I, I don't know that I've been able to do it publicly as much as I want to do it today for how, how your testimony is is inspiring to me and and gives me hope. And you know, for you to come from your forge where you are taking literally taking guns uh and turning them into plowshares and then and here we are talking about what what it means to be in this world today. It's just amazing. Now, my little compliment is nothing compared to what you got last weekend. And I want you, you have to let us talk to us a little bit about this because uh, you got the beloved community award at the King Center with Bernice King. I mean, that must have been just one of those moments. 
It, it was really special. Uh, you know, I was thinking, though, as you were talking, Paul, we, the, I, I don't know if you've seen these T-shirts, but you were saying, you know, I'm not that kind of Christian. There's these shirts now that say, I'm the love your neighbor kind of Christian, not the storm the capital kind, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? I right. mean, that's amazing. That's it. That's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Right, right, right. Well, we're going to get there, by the way. And we're honestly, going to talk about that. Know, yeah, honestly, but, but congr- I want to talk a little bit about what it meant to to – to, to be at the King Center, to be, you know, in the company of amazing people who you must have, who must have been there. And then, and to consider yourself part of that legacy. That's, that's really remarkable. Yeah. Well, I mean, and first of all, you know, this, this is very connected because the first time that I uh, got to meet and spend a little bit of time with Dr. Bernice King, we were, we were really grieving the state of Christianity in in the sense of like sort of the loud voices, like what we've um, the distorted image of Christianity that's out there. Um, And, you know, we've, we've done several things uh, over the years together, but it, it was, it's one of those things I I get kind of uh, embarrassed, you know, because I'm not big on hype. You, you, you know, that Paul and I, you know, Tony always says, beware when people speak well of you. That's what they said of the false prophets, you know? <laughs> so, Thanks, you know, Tony. Okay. I, Last time I speak well of Tony Campolo, who, by the right. way, I, I think is a fabulous person, but I, I won't say that aloud anymore. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I so I, I'm not, you know, really big on the hype and awards, but I, I, I mean, gosh, if there's anybody that, you know, has the credibility to, to really celebrate, um, redemptive work. I mean, Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, um, Dr. Bernice and the King Center. I mean, they're they're doing such beautiful work and really still have that edge and the charism of Dr. King, you know, the love and the justice. And so um, when they told me that I'd be receiving this award, you know, I mean, I was just floored, you know, on my yeah. knees and yeah and uh oh, and then yeah. it just kept unfolding you know it they surprised me with reverend barber who's you know a dear friend a part of red letter oh, christian oh, we've marched oh. we've gone to jail together and he got the award last year uh but came back this year to present it to me and oh, wow. uh that was just a i mean the whole thing i had my family there my I, as i said i had my in-laws and my outlaws you know <laughs> <laughs> well, okay i think we just got to back to east tennessee but uh that 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 sounds i mean how how wonderful and and uh you know i agree i mean that if we're if we're looking for an example for a christian the kind of christian that we need today we we should look at king who uh was fueled by his faith who was you know governed by the you know the the mandates of Jesus around about around both peace and justice going hand in hand i mean it's just amazing and so uh for you to be in that in that uh it, it recognized there that's uh, congratulations thanks bro your, your just, glow just is coming through uh, but, but that's and east tennessee was well represented dolly parton also got uh you know uh the award for her work on education and literacy you know and Lord. So, you know, Lord. our our grandparents grew up on the same hillside, so that was something special. You know, and there were what? so many. What? Oh my God! So okay, <laughs> now now it's interesting. <laughs> it was all you know, King Barber, you. That's fine, but Dolly Parton. Now you got my attention. Honestly, I think she's the only person in America that everybody likes. You know, I mean, I I, I I do. I think like if she ran for president, it's it's done. No one else needs to run. <laughs> Dolly Parton for president. We were together next to the Capitol um, just a couple of weeks ago on on January 6th, recognizing what happened. You wrote a really interesting um, op ed uh, article about about that and and talking about Paul's letter to the Galatians. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're seeing this Christian nationalism. I mean, you again, like you know, you you come out of a more you know evangelical Christian tradition. What's happening? I mean, you know, I mean, it's not your. I'm not putting it on you. I'm just saying, like, can you offer any insight into what what's going on? Like how, where, where are we um, with the <laughs> kind of white evangelicals? You have to solve this for us today by the end of this conversation. Okay, friend. 
Well, you know, when we were together in, in that op-ed, I quoted uh, uh, Paul's letter to Galatians, which I think is so appropriate when it comes to what's happening right now. And he said, I mean, this is a quote from Galatians 1, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And he says, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So, I mean, that it's, it's pretty amazing how the, true those words ring you know, to us today, because this, it really is a perversion of the Christian faith. Um, I, I don't I, anytime I put Christian nationalism together, I put Christian in quotes because the word Christian means Christ like. And that's, you know, what really breaks my heart is that there's nothing Christ-like about what happened on January 6th. There's not much that's Christ-like that I hear from uh, folks that have been um, supporters of Trump, that have been champions of Christian nationalism. I think many of them, um, you know, what you don't hear much of is love. And that's what Jesus said, that you, they will know that you belong to me by your love. Uh, all the law is summed up into this love, love God, mm. love your neighbor. So, you know, there there may have been a lot of Jesus flags and bumper stickers, as our friend Amanda Tyler says, you know, that Jesus was the mascot. Um, mascot. But, Damn, but that's the, good. Yeah. But there, was, there wasn't anything that that really looked like Jesus, sounded like Jesus, uh, or you know, and you don't see that love that we see in Jesus. So I don't see any reason to call it Christian. Um because, you know, that that but there is this kind of pursuit of power that mm. um, it's, it's as if like we never heard Jesus say, what good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? <laughs> you know, what wow. good is it to win yeah. a majority of the Supreme Court seats and lose your soul? And that's what we saw happen is that people really forfeited their soul for the pursuit of political power. And, you know, as, as, as our friend Tony Campolo says, when you try to mix political power with the Christian faith, it's kind of like mixing ice cream with cow manure. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't do much damage to the manure, but it ruins, absolutely ruins the ice cream. And so this pursuit of power um, is what it's about. But, you know, underneath that, man, there's, there's so many layers of th that. There's no coincidence that this kind of current iteration of the culture war came on the back of the first black president, the changing demographics of America, right. even how we're telling the truth about history. There are people mm. that want to go back. You know, they're, they're, that's when people say make America great again. Uh, I think many of them are very clearly saying make America white again. And this is about yeah. feeling like people are replacing us. It's about not having... Oh. The control, uh, you know, the the ability to be the moral gatekeepers of society. So, you know, I think that's all underneath yeah. it. Honestly, one of the one of the things that I think has been so valuable with Amanda's work at Christians Against Christian Nationalism is exactly what you just did. Is like preaching a different kind of truth. We're not ceding the Christian space here, but also saying like this has been part of the Christian legacy in America. Christians have been at this for a long time, unfortunately, you know, the legitimization of slavery, you know, and all the, you know, and so, so I think this is, it's not unexpected, but, but I think the way you just outlined it is just so helpful. And I, I appreciate it so much. I want to talk a little bit about your book. Why this book? Why this book right now? <laughs> Well, uh, so, I mean, the new book that's coming out is uh, Rethinking Life. Before I get there, though, I think it's important that the last two books that I wrote were about fairly particular issues. One, um, Executing Grace is about the death penalty, but right. it's bigger than the death penalty, right? It's, it's the whole idea that at the heart of our faith is an executed and risen savior <laughs> right. who totally. said, I didn't, I didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick, you know, blessed are the merciful, all this stuff. And so it, it raises the question, is anybody beyond redemption? And that's mm. that to me, that's what the death penalty is about. And, and what was so troubling to me is that the, the biggest demographic of supporters for the death penalty in America are Christians. 
uh, yep. particularly white evangelical Christians. Right. Um, and, and, and the Bible belt is the death belt. You know, that, I mean, states like Tennessee, right? We still have the electric chair in Tennessee, Paul. Um, and we just used it. Not, I mean, like, so th- that's, you know, that's the backdrop for that. And then my, after that, I wrote Beating Guns because I discovered that Christians are also the biggest gun owners and gun enthusiasts in America. So two thirds of Americans live without guns, two thirds, but almost half of the Christians own guns. <laughs> I mean, we own wow. guns you know what? I, I had agree. never heard exactly that statistic. That is really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, th- this is, this is problematic to me, you know, I mean, I, cause I, I really think, you know, Jesus is the Prince of peace. He said, love your enemies. It becomes impossible to love our enemies and simultaneously prepare to kill them, you know? And, and so I think like the cross and the gun give us two really different versions of power. And one of them says, I'm willing to die. And the other says, I'm willing to kill. And I think it's really impossible to kind of try to hold those together. Um, But then, you know, I I really began to realize that we've got to build a broader foundation for our value of life. And that's what this, you know, new book, Rethinking Life is about, is, is not just one issue, but going, what does it really what are the implications of believing that every single person is equally made in the image of God? Um, uh-huh. and, and, and that conviction that um, every person is sacred. So, you know, I get into like how abortion, you know, be, began to eclipse all of the other issues when we think about what it means to be for life, you know, pro-life yeah. champ, champions yeah. of life. Um, but I also, you know, and, and, and this, the, the response from for Black Lives Matter, that all lives matter, you know. So that's that, that's kind of the the. <laughs> that's, that's really that's it's really into. interesting, yeah. you know. I I think that you know I, I'd actually love to hear you know I, I'm my whole family mostly the women in my family are very strongly pro choice and as am I, but I understand you know there is a there is another side to that issue and uh, you know as much as. I want laws to protect people's right to choose. I also respect people when they say that's not what I want to do. And that's what, not what I want my family to do. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm curious how you, how you, how you thread that needle for yourself and how you imagine society threading that needle. Well, I, I think that one of the reasons that this is a, a tricky issue, more complicated than some of the other ones, is because Jesus doesn't mention it. Um, it's it's really not even um, uh, we don't even have teaching on it in the scripture. There's a couple of like verses that we might have, you know, create implications for abortion. There's one kind of obscure one in in the um, in Exodus, but um, you know, like when it comes to really the teaching of scripture, this is an issue that. We, we it's hard to like know. And I think it's really complicated because um, I don't think we're all going to resolve uh, when we believe that life begins. And I, I have some polls that um, I did and others have done to show that like we're really divided on folks that think it begins at conception. It be- begins, you know, at heartbeat. It begins at, uh, you know, when the baby can live outside of the, the womb. So, the, you know, some folks believe it begins at first breath. That's what, you know, many Jewish folks believe. So it's very tricky to uh, resolve that. But here's what I began. Uh, I kind of suggest <laughs> I offer is that can we say that we want to protect life um, by trying to reduce the number of abortions? Um, the the old you know uh, uh, statement that many used to say is abortion be should be legal, safe, and rare, and let's work to make it rare and rare. Now, incidentally, I think some people immediately think to making it illegal. But if you look at what's most effective in actually reducing the number of abortions, uh, it's things like health care and child care, having access to affordable child care. Um, many things that have been blocked by folks that say that they want to eliminate abortion. And yet the number one cause of abortion consistently is financial stability and feeling like uh, someone's not able to to economically care for uh, another child. So um, 
I really you know, appreciate I, I kind of want to step back and think about it, you know, with a little bit broader lens, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I think that's really, really helpful. And, you know, it, one of the, the great ironies is the wrong word, but all the states that are outlawing abortion have just no support for new mothers. No, no maternity care, no, no money for anything. You know, I mean, it's really like a, it's it's an absolute, you know, you can't do one and then not give the, you know, so it, it's really like a, it's one of these things. I really appreciate what you're trying to do there and also to take it back. And, you know, I love that you're including like the the Black Lives Matter movement and, and just really taking this into um into the lives of people, you know, across the across the country and across the spectrum. So I think that you, you, you know the, the the idea of rethinking life. I think anybody who's looking at your book is going to say, "Oh, this is a bo- abortion book," but but you're, the way you're, what you're saying is actually no, it's not. It's actually a life book, and let me let, you know, let me let me let me claim all of those things. You are someone who has changed your mind on some things over the years, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, like, you know, and this is this, I, I don't, I don't know, like exactly the progression. And I've had to, ch- I've, I'm not saying you, you changed your mind. I started perfect. and I, I maintained that. Uh, but you have changed. Some things. Uh, you know, I mean, I, we all have changed our mind. I, but I am curious as someone who comes from an evangelical white evangelical background, and then took these, you know, very, what do you view as a constructive engagement? And have you experienced anything recently that gave you hope as far as constructive engagement? Because I think we're all looking for, we all believe in that, but we're all trying to figure out how do we do that in a way that um, that actually like lives out our principles and helps us understand more, but then also like, you know, hopefully creates a, a more cohesive society. Yeah, well... I, I started to realize, Paul, that I, I don't know too many people who changed their mind because they lost an argument. <laughs> and um, I, I believe in doing better theology, you know, countering bad theology with good theology. I believe in engaging like our minds. But I also know that a lot of times our hearts change and our heads follow our hearts. And mm. And for me, like, on a lot of these things, um, I had worked out in my head what I thought, and then I got closer to the people impacted by it, and I saw the holes in my own theology, you know. But for instance, I mean, that's the case with being uh, visiting folks on death row. Um, I met folks that I know are innocent um, that are facing uh, execution. I also met folks that are guilty and they've told me what they did. And I've seen what, you know, God has done in their life over years and years. And that's why I believe so passionately that the death penalty um, betrays the gospel, the possibility of redemption, you know, Um, and somewhere, I mean, even with abortion, as I was writing about this book, I didn't know some of the, the women that I'm closest to in my life, including my mom. Um, have had an abortion that didn't I, we didn't have safe places to talk about that you know um, I talked to someone as I was researching for rethinking life that had twins and lost one of them late in her pregnancy and is faced with this horrendous decision and I mean you you, you know we hear all this stuff on the news about late-term abortions you're like and I'm still yet to meet any woman that just decided you know I'm gonna have an abortion without any like without it threatening her life or the life of the the child inside of her. And so I, I think we get, you know, so polarized by our opinions and, and, um, and, and one of the people I really point to in, in rethinking life, but also is true in my own life, Paul, that has shaped how I think about some of these things is mother Teresa. You know, I worked with her in India when she was still alive and she is known for her passion about abortion but she also called governors the night before executions <laughs> and said, uh-huh. do what Jesus would have you do. I'm praying for you to show mercy, you know? Uh-huh. And I mean, she got in the middle of wars and, and rescuing people that were um, injured in those wars. And she was such a passionate voice for life and, you know, never picketed an abortion clinic with a, you know, abortion is murder sign. Like she just, like love people. She came alongside people that were in really difficult situations. Um, and so, 
you know, to me, that's what I want to be. I want to be that kind of activist, you know, yeah. like, and, and, and opinions and bumper stickers, they don't necessarily require much of us, you know? Yeah. And yet the, the question I'm asking all through this new book is what does love require of us? Uh, what does, what does it uh, mean to love folks that are, um, you know, immigrants? What does it mean to and, love? And, and you know, to, so, yeah, I think, I think part of what, you know, part of what you've just been talking about is what it, what it means also to show up in the places with a heart that is, is loving. So like mm. you going to death row, you going to like, you know, I think part of your, the origins of your ministry is that you, you know, you weren't sure what to do. And so you moved to, you know, a, a very rough part of, of Philly and you just try, you know, you try to live there and love your neighbors. And, you know, I mean, like, I think it makes, I, I think I'm at my best when I show up and I, with an attitude of trying to learn and love and mm. um, have it, have it have it changed me expect to be changed as much as I'm there to offer any witness. So I think that, I just think that like, uh, whatever the ministry of, of presence and, uh, you know, I think you showing up on, you know, on January 6th with a cross that was a gun at the mo, you know, thinking of like what it meant for the, the, the many people, several people who died that day because of violence um, in part inspired by a, a warped Christian sense. So I just think what you're, what you're doing is great. What are you, you know, it, it, I remember you wrote a book called Jesus for president. Do I have that right? Yeah. 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 I, I am like, I've, I've thought about that a bunch of times and, and wondered like, what does it mean? What is the, we, we decry the role of religion in politics and yet, Sometimes it's just like, you know, it's impossible not to be involved and not to feel like our faith is calling us to a certain, a certain, you know, political leaning or something like that. And that comes from all sides. I'm curious how you view that today. And if you're still Jesus is president kind of, you know, in that it, it, believe in everything you wrote at that time, or does this feel like a different time? Yeah, well, we, we, you know, we incidentally just re-released Jesus for President this past year. We wrote a new uh, forward to it, and I went back through the old content kind of looking at it. And, uh, it, it, you know, this is this was really the fire in our bones when we wrote Jesus for President, was that this is about how we hope, right, and, and where our hope resides. And the challenge, I think, with political engagement is we end up misplacing our hope and we put our hope in a person or a candidate or a party to change the world. And the interesting thing I see in the early Christians um, and that I hope is true of me is that um, every time they were saying Jesus is Lord, they were saying Caesar is not. And it was a declaration of their hope. You know, as the old hymn goes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other ground is sinking sand. So, you know, our hope is not in the, uh, you know, the elephant of the GOP or the donkey of the Democrats, but it's really grounded in Christ. And a lot of these issues, to me, are not about left and right. They're about right and wrong. And they really go to the center of our faith. So Jesus, for me, is the sounding board. Um uh -huh. And the more the moral compass, you know, so when we think about immigrants, um, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. I mean, it doesn't get much clearer than that. And interesting, like like some of our highest numbers of refugees and immigrants have been welcomed under Republican presidents. Some of our worst policies have evolved even now are still evolving. I mean, I'm very disappointed with our current immigration policy and what's happening on the border um, uh, uh, and, you know, with with some of the other things like military spending. It's not really a partisan thing. You know, um, uh, Obama raised Bush's military budget. Trump raised Obama's military budget. Biden raised Trump's military budget, you know, and now we're spending right. twenty five thousand dollars every single second <laughs> you know so it just wow. boggles the mind so yeah right. 
But, you know, that's where Jesus, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor, reorients everything uh, for me. So I'm not partisan, uh, but I do think that when we wrote Jesus for President, Paul, as you may know, we had we had some serious anar Christian anarchistic leanings, you know, coming out yes. of the, the Catholic worker movement, Dorothy Day and others. And, um, you know, probably had a, a, a sign on the wall that said if voting changed anything, it would be illegal, you know, stuff like that. So it was, you know, I think that um, what I think now is that voting is one tool that we have in the toolbox that we should use and there's a price to pay for not using it um and i would say i've learned a lot of that from uh from friends of color you know like folks like reverend barber and yeah um and 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 other other folks that have seen a different side of this than me as a white person um their ancestors you know went to jail and died for this i mean being at the you know the king center of course this week you know you you're reminded of that so now what i think i think of voting as damage control, as harm reduction. And mm -hmm. to me, that's helpful because it's a different posture. You know, I'm not thinking this is going to be the, you know, the, the, the single thing that's going to change the world. But I do want to harness the principalities and powers. I want to vote uh, for the person that I think is going to do the least amount of damage to the world, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, no, I think some, that's some absolutely might say right. It's cynical, but you know, I, I no, think it's, it's not cynical yeah. at all. It's actually a, it's a, it's a, it's a stance. And I remember there were a lot, um, specifically of, you know, I just remember a lot of black women speaking up in the election between Clinton and Trump, uh, in 2016 saying, we don't have an option not to vote in this it, because we're, you know, no one's perfect, but we are trying to avoid damage to our community. And there were people who sat that out because they, you know, they felt like neither one of the options were good. But that, but really, there were people who just said that that was a privileged stance. Yeah. You know that that you know that we need now we see what's about what's coming at us, and uh, so I I think that's really, you know, really really interesting and important. Um, yeah, dude, you know, the, and the other thing is, I, I think I've seen like um, that. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of folks that are very disappointed with the, the you know, Congress, the Supreme Court. I mean, and, and so there's a great article in The Atlantic that said, how will this generation change Washington when they hate it so much? <laughs> right. and, and so there is a disappointment there. But I think there's also a sense for me that I, when I'm vote, when I think about voting, I also think one way to think about it is. I'm voting in solidarity with mm -hmm. those whose lives are at stake. I'm voting for asylum seekers and immigrants. I'm voting for uh, folks that are um, struggling with poverty and health care. So in one sense, like I'm going to vote for those who are most vulnerable in our society um, and vote against the forces that are crushing their lives. And some of these things like governor races, I didn't even pay attention. So I started you know, I started working on the death penalty and there's some things that I think governors don't have a whole lot of influence on, but I mean, when it comes to executing people, and this is the craziest thing, like the governor in almost every state in this country has the sole power to stop executions or to continue them. In Pennsylvania, we still have the death penalty, but we have a governor that says, I don't want to kill anybody. And, yeah. and that, you know, so, I mean, they, these things can make a difference. Yeah. This is a big question, but it's something that, you know, that I'm thinking a lot about is like, what is the, are the best ways we can protect democracy right now? Protect, you know, the ability for people to feel like they have a right to live in dignity and respect and also to have control over the, the way they live their lives. What are the ways you're thinking about democracy right now? Well, so there's there's a, a couple of things that come to mind. And one of them is that I, I really believe that one of the biggest threats to democracy is this version of nationalism that's trying to camouflage itself as Christianity. Um, and I mean, we saw that evidenced on January 6th. Um, not only is it a threat to democracy, but it's also a threat to authentic Christian faith. It's distorting our faith in the same way that extremists have extorted, you know, have distorted other, um, you know, faiths. And so I'm very concerned about that. Um, one of the anecdotes, I think, is 
uh, to get our history right. You know, as Christians, we, we know that saying like the truth will set you free. And, um, you know, the, when, when we think of our history, this is one of the battles that's, you know, uh, been going on is, are we going to tell the truth about our history? Um, the, the movement for black lives has really helped to, um, helped us remember that we we've buried so many different lies of how we remember history. I mean, all over the South, we have statues of folks that were on the wrong side of history. And so the battle over the statues, the battle over, you know, critical race theory, we, we had a statue in Tennessee, Paul, of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the found one of the founders of the KKK that was in the, the Tennessee state Capitol until just like two years ago. So, this is, you know, we're we're not going to get our future right until we get our history right. And, you know, in, in the evangelical faith, you know, version of Christianity, we, we have this high value for confession. <laughs> you know, like mm. you, you, mm. you repent of your sins, and that means admitting that you've done something wrong. It means confessing what you've done. I mean, there's scripture that says confess your sins to one another, the entire um some of some of the church believes it's a sacrament. You know, there's something holy that happens. So I believe that, you know, that Dr. King was right, that um, racism is uh, our our history of racism is like an untreated wound that we've just buried. And it continues to fester. It continues to get infected until we treat it. Um and, you know, so I, I, I think that's, you know, a, a good start is to tell the truth and then to 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 begin to wrestle with what that truth means for us now. How do we heal some of the wounds and repair some of the harm that was yeah. that was done from, you know, those sins, really? Yeah. 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 I, I just find it mystifying the, this idea that people are going to try to contain Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches, pretend like. He and others weren't trying to, you know, set the record straight on race, whatever, uh, 60 years ago. And now we're trying to bring that back even. I think we're in a crisis moment. I, I, I absolutely agree. And yet there are so many good people out there, yourself included. And I, I just want to let you know that I'm cheering you on here. I'm I'm ready to to partner on so many things. And I'm looking forward to that going forward. So... Shane Claiborne, congratulations on your new book. Tell us the name one more time. Rethinking Life and the subtitles Embracing the Sacredness of Every Person. Uh, and also congratulations on your award at the King Center and, and all you're doing. What What's a way that someone can find out more of, about what you do? I think Red Letter Christians is a great outlet for opinion pieces, really, really great stuff. For folks to be able to follow you, what would be the best way? If you do some social media, I see you around, but it's not your. Yeah, primary. man, I'm pretty active on uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, so folks can find me there. It's just my name, uh, and yep. then yeah, we we really are building a movement. Um, Red Letter Christians, Paul, you've been integral to all that, and um, one of the things that we say is that the way that we change the narrative is by changing the narrators. And so there's a whole bunch of musicians, writers, preachers, uh, pastors, you know, folks just doing really creative, beautiful work that looks like Jesus, that, yeah. you know, sounds oh, like my Jesus. goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's so great to talk to you. It's so I mean, I love it. Shane Claiborne is an activist, best-selling author, and popular speaker who brings the teachings of his faith into very real hands-on action. Shane, thank you so much for being with us on State of Belief Radio. Thank you, buddy. Let's do it again soon. See you. Today's technology has connected us like never before and made it possible for both loving relationships and terrible hate to thrive online. On Wednesday, January 25th, Interfaith Alliance is releasing an important new report titled Big Tech, Hate, and Religious Freedom Online. And that same day, we're having a webinar featuring expert voices on this topic, which will highlight the urgency of the situation and hopefully offer real solutions. 
Spearheading this immense effort at Interfaith Alliance has been advocacy associate Rhea Coley, and I'm happy that she is with us today to preview what's coming on Wednesday. So, Rhea, welcome to State of Belief Radio. Thank you. Excited to be here. All right. So tell me why we released this report, Big Tech, Hate, and Religious Freedom Online. What's the motivation to get this out there? Yeah, well, we know that hate and harassments are intense and urgent threats to religious freedom. You know, a single act of hate can make an entire community feel unsafe and really fear being targeted just because of their religion or identities. And the sad reality is, is that hate and harassment don't just exist offline anymore, and it hasn't for a long time. And social media platforms host hateful content, but what this report really emphasizes is that these platforms amplify it. So I think it's just highlighting this urgent threat and ensuring that people are aware and what we can do from here. I love that. That's so important. And it's really, it affects real lives. Like we think, oh, the online world. Online, offline, it's the same thing. It's people and and there doesn't even need to be an offline threat for people to feel threatened and unsafe and intimidated into not expressing their religious belief, experiencing their religion. And I think what's really exciting about this is how, yes, we're talking about hate and we're talking about um, big tech, but we're also talking about religious freedom. And we're talking about the way people experience their religion and live out their religion online, which should be safe without intimidation. And it should be, you know, we should think about it as invitational rather than intimidation. So this is really important. I mean, excited for it to be released next Wednesday on uh, January 25th. So who would you like the audience to be? Who, If you could sit someone down and say, I want you to read this report, who, who is it? Is it our listeners? Are, is it politicians? Is it uh, executive attack? All of the above? Who, who do you have in mind? You know, I really think the kind of people that would benefit from this reading this report is really anybody who uses social media, um, which is, you know, a wide list of people. Um, Social media is so ubiquitous in our lives that understanding how platforms um, sort of catalog and show you content is so important to being a media literate person in this day and age. And I think anybody would benefit from understanding um, what kind of content they're seeing on social media and why and what kind of structural aspects of the big tech industry and the platforms themselves, how they contribute to cataloging how you see the content online. And it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. so much. I think, I, I think it's so important for people to realize you're not going into a neutral space. You're not going into a space, you know, someone created the space into which you're stepping and it has all sorts of dangerous tides and eddies and flows. And if you're not aware of them, it it will affect them and they're intentional. And, and so, like, I think what you're doing is helping any any Internet user, any social media user, which, by the way, just it can be Facebook. It can be Twitter. It can be TikTok. It, it can be, you know, really almost almost any time you go online, you're affected by this. Am I right about that? A hundred percent. I think it's totally right to view this as th- the intentional cataloging of what you see. And I think we all have a right to know why we see it and where we see it and how the platforms that we spend so much of our time on are choosing to show us content that may not be true or is hateful and just right. makes us feel unsafe in our daily lives. Well, one of the things that I've, I saw in your report, I've had a sneak preview, people, I'm very, very privileged, uh, is, um, is the idea of monetizing hate, which means like, you know, actually hate is something that benefits companies. and But the, the victims of that are those of us who may want to share a prayer online, who may want to, you know, uh, join one another for Shabbat or, um, or or Friday prayer. And yet we, we, can, we get attacked online and we feel unsafe and we feel intimidated and shut down because the, the, the algorithms are inviting people who are are, are inviting hate into our lives. So the, much more in the report that we'll be dropping on Wednesday, January 25th. I, on that same day, we're having a webinar and I just, I'm, I am moderating it and I'm so excited because we, you have collected this incredible panel that I just think is like, you know, 
the, one of the most impressive. T- tell me a little bit. Uh, t- tell our listeners a little bit about who's on that panel and and what they can expect. Yeah, absolutely. So we have three really exciting guests for the panel next week. Um, Zaki Barzinji from Aspen Digital, who does work at the intersection of tech policy, equity, and justice for in- underrepresented communities. We also have Lauren Krapp, who's Technology Policy and Advocacy Council at the Anti-Defamation League, and Paul Barrett from NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights, who's done a lot of research and writing on the role of social media and big tech in a democracy. So it's a really interesting cross-section of perspectives, which I'm sure will lend itself to a really exciting and insightful conversation on a pretty nebulous issue. Yeah, this is like a great compliment to the um, to the report that's coming out on January twenty fifth, uh, and and it will be actually you know people will be able to access uh, access it on our website and um, at interfaithalliance dot org. Again, big tech hate and religious freedom online is the report that's coming out on January twenty fifth that same day. What time is it? Can you remind me? Is it noon? Eastern? 12 p.m. Eastern, yeah. Noon Eastern. Okay, great. And how can people sign up? Yeah, so uh, we have a Zoom registration link um, that's been sent out through email. People can go on social media as well. Um, We're we're also, you know, you have to venture into social media to get to to get to sign up to the thing about the social media, but venture onto social media. Also, if you go to interfaithalliance.org, we're going to have a, a, a link right there for you to sign up. So please go out and do that and join us. It's going to be really spectacular. Rhea, I really appreciate you joining us here today for a little taste of what's to come and more next week when we're going to be able to feature the speakers from that panel, which, by the way, I just want to say, if you're not in this world of digital, like who's really thinking about digital, Those, this is an all-star panel. We're thrilled to have them, and, and I hope... All of you can join us. Sign up at interfaithalliance.org. And we look forward to joining us on next week, 25th of January at noon. Ria, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Before I let you go, I just want to let you know that I spent the last week in Texas, in Dallas and in Austin. And in Dallas, we did an amazing training called Interfaith Advocacy. And it we collected this amazing group of people from different faith backgrounds as well as secular who wanted to come together and learn about how they can work together to make their community the community that they deserve to live in. And it was so wonderful, gratifying to be with them and to to learn from them, to be in community with them. And the greatest praise that we got at the end of the training was that a pastor stood up and she said, you know, I just feel less alone. And that's what all of our work is about. It's for people to feel less alone, more connected to their colleagues, more collected to their community, and and more a part of the solutions to living up to the values of our faith and the values of our constitution that everyone is deserving of equal dignity, equal respect, and equal justice under the law. So I I just wanted to let you know that... um, I've been out and about and so gratified by some of the work that's going on in Texas. And next month, we're headed to Southern Florida and looking forward to doing similar work uh, in places that really need a sense of community and uh, power in the facing of these days, especially the white Christian nationalism that is really, really strong in many of the areas of our country and an existential threat to our democracy. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week's show. We need your help keeping this show on air, and I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. You can be a part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with family and friends. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in these conversations both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. 
State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. And until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch, and that's State of Belief. I think it's time we stop, children. What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down.